Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for the introduction. So the web is not old. We've been using it for about 30 years now, but it's been constantly evolving over time. So we've seen different ways of creating content, different ways of using it, and also different devices of using the web. For example, HTTP was introduced in 1991, and then after that, we've seen things like, for example, GeoCities, which allowed people to uh, upload websites online without having to know what a server is. And that was something, it was, I think for me, it was the start of the web as we see it now. And then in 1999 and 2000, we had something called like Web 2.0, which is kind of the second version of the web where the focus would be more on user generated content. So you see lots of blogs um, and personal website and kind of like GeoCity, but a bigger scale. So everyone in the world would do it. It was not something uh, that was only in the States. And also we've seen REST and SOAP, which are technologies that have been used to allow different services to communicate to, together. And also we're now using them to have clients, application communicated with a backend. And especially REST um, became really, really popular. And I think it's a beautiful uh, concept. So you use HTTP and use HTTP verbs to the operation of your resources. So for example, you can do a get, get a list of posts, you can do a post and create a new post, or change it, then you can have delete and post to create, for example, a new comment, and there is also patch and some other non-standard non ones. And it's really nice. Um, and in 2004, we've seen apps like Gmail and Google, app, uh, Google Maps that were basically pushing the boundaries of the web, the, what the web could be. This is 2004, like, uh, it was something really, really different, seeing this application running on a browser you could do things without having to ref refresh the page, and it was really powerful. And then in 2006, we've seen Facebook that then became uh, a global scale uh, social network. And this is quite important because they start having problems that normally you wouldn't have because it's, they start having like billions of users, uh, thousands, millions of different devices, and also problem with like network um, and also low bandwidth and so on. Then in 2007, another important change was the iPhone followed by Android devices. And this would mark a shift in the way we, we built applications for, uh, for the web. We start having uh, mobile websites and mobile applications. And in current days, the web is still evolving. Uh, so we don't have collections of documents anymore, but we have apps. And these apps are not simple applications. They are really complex. Even for a simple website, like my website uh, was a single page application, which seems simple, but you still have as an API behind, and uh, it's, it, it's complex. It's not just HTML and CSS. Um, and it also makes sense to build applications now instead of just static websites, because in the developer experience is much, much nicer than what it was before. Um, so we started creating APIs. Um, is APIs to basically allow like a client to communicate with a backend or also communicate between different backends or just even if in a startup you could have a front end team and a back end team and oops, sorry and you would have um, APIs to basically connect them together instead of building like a monolith for example um, and rest became in industry standard at least in the non enterprise world but it really didn't scale with time. Um, while it still makes sense for some use cases, you still have some issues like, for example, underfetching, which basically means you do a request and then you have to do more requests to get more data or the other data you need. For example, you have a, a blog post uh, where you want to get information about the author, but the author, for example, is a, a link to the author, so you need to do another get to, to fetch that information. The a solution for this would be to create a new endpoint where you get all the data, but then you have issues like overfetching where you sending way too much data to a client that's basically not needed. And I think for me, the other issue that was really painful is way too many endpoints to remember. Because imagine if you have 100 resources, you would need to do at least 100 uh, uh, URLs endpoints. And with that, you also need to, document to add documentation, to to basically document all the endpoints that you have, all the ways that you can use the endpoints, filters, and so on. While you have some tools, especially in Python, to generate the documentation is still painful because there are this bit of manual work to do. So we start looking for some alternatives, and we are thinking, what if uh, the clients that we have could declare the data that we need, that they need? Um, 
So let's say we have a client that needs something like this, so it needs a list of categories, and for, for each category it needs a name. Um, we could send a document like this saying, oh, I need the category and the name, which this is basically like a JSON, but doesn't have the values. So we would send this to the backend, and the backend would respond with the, uh, this. And this is basically what GraphQL is. GraphQL is a query language, and it's being created by Facebook uh, in 2012, and then released as open source in 2015. Um, and it's being used now in production by Twitter, GitHub, and loads of other sites, I think Reddit as well. And it can be used with HTTP, it doesn't have to, so you can use it with WebSocket as well, or any other protocols if you need to. And in the case of HTTP, there is only one endpoint, and you send the data, that, you send a document here to request the data that you want. So you do something like this, HTTP post slash GraphQL, and you send something like this. And you get back the data that you ask for. And for example, if you want to ask for more information, you can do it. Just change the shape of your document, and then the response is going to be um, uh, this one based on what you ask for. It also has a type, so every GraphQL um, API has a schema. And the schema basically lists all the type that you have and all the fields that you have for each type. So for example, in the previous API, we have a type query, which is the root of our API. So all the fields are coming from the root query. And then in this case, we have a categories, which is a list of categories. Then we have type category, which has a name, and then a list of menu items. And then menu item is only a name and, and a description. Um, and then oh, we, having all this together, it basically allows you, us to uh, use tools like this one to basically have um, an easy way to get the documentation and do testing, for example. Let's see if I can get to the, yeah, here we go. So, so we can see the schema that we, we had before, and we, we can also see the documentation. So, um, so for example, you can see we have a list of queries here. There is only one, categories, and then the type is category, and then there's names, things. So you can explore the API like this without having to basically write any code or check the actual implementation of the API. And for example, when you can add description to the types, so in this case, um, declaring what the string is, but you can do this with any type. And this will also allow to, uh, to do testing like this, so you can use autocomplete and you can basically explore the API and, and test it, which is super powerful because you don't have to do uh, much work to, to, to put this in practice. Um, I'm gonna show a bigger demo later. Um, let's see, that didn't change. Okay, so I was only talking about um, uh, querying now. So this is how you do a query in GraphQL. So you can specify the operation type, which is query in this case, and then an operation name, which is only used for debugging purposes. So for example, you can have logs with the, all the operation names, and then you can specify the fields that you want. And this is the extended version. You don't, if you're j just doing a query, you don't have to pass query and the name. So you can do what we, we've seen before. But if you want to, for example, edit data, you can use mutations, which they work the same. So you have a name, the, the operation type, then a name, and you can also pass arguments. Uh, for, for example, in this case, we are passing an argument called ID to the edit category mutation, and then we are passing a hardcoded title in this case, and then we're fetching the data. So basically, mutation they basically work the same as queries, so the same syntax and the same result. So you can also, you can do a mutation, you can request for the data that you want back. It doesn't have to uh, be a different data. It has, can be what you want. And then the other one, is, for me, it's really interesting, is subscription. So you, it's an easy way to subscribe to an event happening on the backend. So in this case, we can subscribe to an event called on category update, and every time some, this event is called, we get the data back, but only the data that we requested. So it's really powerful. It's you have one way of declaring data that you need for all the operations. And there's much more. There are tools that I think I'm, we're gonna use where I, where I work now to basically build an API gateway. So you have one single gateway that's talking to different um, GraphQL APIs, and then it's gonna basically do the uh, API calls for you. So for example, if you have a user microservices and a post microservices, and you're asking for you, the user and the post is gonna do a a query to both of them, but for your client, for your front end, this is tran transparent, which is really powerful. And if you work with front end, uh, there are clients that make um, 
dealing with GraphQL really, really easy. You don't have to do much. Like for example, uh, I was at Meetup a couple of weeks ago, and there were they were using there was a company that was using REST, and they were saying we spend about two thirds of our time on the front end dealing with data, so fetching the data, normalizing it, uh, storing in a temporary store, and then uh, showing it on the front end. And with GraphQL, the first three steps are basically already done for you. You just use a client, you define it that you want, and then you get it back. And if you want to see some example in the front end, you can talk with me later. But yeah, we use Python, and we love Python. Uh, and I think Python syntax is really beautiful, and especially with Python 3, with the additional features that we've seen, uh, like for example, typings, which I think it's my favorite feature in Python 3. Uh, so typings are basically a way to annotate functions and uh, variables and classes with types. And you can use these types, for example, as um, you can do type checking, so you can check if your function is being called with the correct uh, variables. Um, and you can also use this at runtime using tools like Inforce, where you can say, I want this function to raise an error if the type that's being passed is wrong. And this it's not what you usually want, but it's useful in some cases, especially if you're dealing, for example, with external APIs and you need things to be in control. And you can also, there is also things like MyPyC that it's optimizing the, your, it's kind of compiling the code in a way, or using the type annotation as a hint. And then the other feature that I really love is called Data Classes, which I think it's been inspired by Atters, if you know the module. And it's basically using uh, typings to allow you to create a data container, so a class that only uh, holds data uh, in a very simple way. So this, this decorator, what it's doing is getting all the fields that you see there, so year and attendees, and then it's creating the init method, representation method, and other methods that you could use for uh, like sorting, uh, comparing um, uh, conferences in this case. And it's really powerful because in, with four lines, you've done something that you do uh, with 30 lines. And Python and GraphQL, I mean, if, you, if you've uh, seen it, it, this, the previous data class, it kind of looks like a GraphQL type. So in this case, we have the same class, which is called EuroPython, and then there are two fields and the, uh, the type. So I created a library called Strawberry, right, where you can use this decorator called Strawberry type, which is basically doing what data classes is doing, just actually using data classes and the dude, but it's also creating GraphQL type. So you can use this and create a server based on that. So yeah, the library is called Strawberry. And the reason why I created it, it's mainly because I wanted to have fun and learning. So I wanted to, um, to experiment with uh, basically creating a new library, thinking of how could people use this, uh, how to make it easier to use. And also the other reason is I want to experiment with new feature because uh, GraphQL is quite new in Python and we are still not, I mean, if you've seen, if you check JavaScript, there are so many libraries and they are doing so many cool things that I think it's worth having them in Python as well, especially because Python is much nicer than JavaScript. Ooh, that went too fast. Um, and also the other thing, it's I really want to improve the ecosystem. So we now have four libraries, but when I started this, we had two libraries. One was using production, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't really updated uh, over time. So I think having other libraries that are trying new things, we can share uh, experience, we can basically cross-pollinate each other with ideas and improve uh, the old ecosystem, okay, hopefully. Um, so how does it work? As I said, it works with type-ins and data classes. So let's see an example. This is the schema that we had before. So we had menu item category. As you can see, it maps one to one to, to Python, more or less. But yeah, as you can see, there is no way, we're not fetching any data here. So, um, I was thinking how to pass the data. There are two options. So one is to um, kind of pass a function to, to the fields, but the other option is this one, which kind of looks like a, um, a property in Python. So you use a decorator, in this case, strawberry field. Um, and then it's using typings again to basically understand what's the type that's been returned. So this is creating a field on the, on the query called categories that returns a list of categories, but you can also, um, get a max categories argument. So in this case, it's doing a fetch of the categories passing uh, either 10 or whatever the limit that you've passed to the argument. And I'm gonna show a demo of this quickly. Um, so yeah, this is what we have before. So again, we can uh, get a list of categories. 
Then for each category, you can get the items. And so basically this, um, it's like 20 lines of Python to have this, which is quite cool. And you can also specify uh, arguments to the, to the fields. So I think this is one of the most popular thing in, in, in GraphQL. So in this case, it's only, it's only returning a one category. And it's really powerful because, for example, you can have a field that can return, for example, the height of something or the dimension of something, and you can specify the unit. So it can be like using a metric system or the imperial system, and you don't really have to do different points or passing filters, get parameters. Um, what does it so yeah, the current features are it supports async, so you can do async IO stuff. Um, so it supports subscription, which is using uh, async IO. So it's really simple to build a something that is listening to PubSub and sending an event back to the to the serve to the front end. It supports mutation queries. There is a debug server that kind of works. It doesn't really work with async because it's been messed here. Um, I didn't really spend much time on it. And then there's support for ASCII. ASCII is um, a synchronous implementation of uh, WSGI. So it's basically, it's WSGI but works with async. And ASCII 3 basically means that it works with any ASCII server. So you can use select, you can use respond, uh, bocadillo, and so on. And soon, this, I'm trying to work on the docs. Uh, I got a bit stuck with the design because I really like things that are really nice to, to look. And then when I have the design, I'm going to finish that. Uh, then I want to make it stable. So we're going to use this, hopefully, for um, if you know PyCon Italia, we're building a new website, and we're probably going to use Strawberry for, for the API. And that means I have a production project where I can test this and make it stable. So we want to have Django support. A friend of mine is doing Django support, uh, which should be ready, hopefully, in less than a month. Then Apollo tracing, which is basically a way to do metrics analysis on, on GraphQL APIs, because it, you don't have, uh, it's a bit different. You can, uh, for each resolver, you can track how much time a field it, it took to load. And then field permission, which is going to work similar to uh, Django REST framework, if you're familiar with that. But you can specify a list of classes on each specific individual field. And then you can validate, for example, if a user can see the field, and so on, which I think is really powerful because it allows you to, to reuse types and without having to worry to, for example, without having to create a public user and a private user. Uh, you can basically check, for example, in the email, you can say, oh, I only want to see the email if the user is the current user or is an admin, which is really powerful. So I really want to see more people using GraphQL in Python. Uh, it doesn't really matter if it's my library or any of the other three. So Graphene, if you want to use GraphQL right now in production, I think the, the only library that works uh, and it's being used in production is Graphene. Then there are the other three. So Strawberry is the one I'm working on. And then there is Ariadne and Tartiflet. And they, they are new. And they take two different approaches. So they use, instead of writing Python to define a schema, you write the schema as a string, as a file. And then you can attach resolver functions, basically, to, uh, to your types, to your fields. So it's a different way of defining the schema. I recommend check them out, because they are really, uh, really interesting. Um, and there are different ways of doing the same thing, which it could fit what you're doing more. Um, so yeah, let's let's go and build uh, better APIs. I think I think as web developers, we we should focus on creating APIs that are really use, easy to use for our developers or front end people or client um, uh, people working on mobile apps, and but also APIs that are really uh, user friendly. So APIs that don't waste data for users. APIs that don't um, um, the, yeah, don't don't waste the bandwidth and the CPU of user because yeah, we, I mean, we are now in in Switzerland and like everyone that's coming f outside, they're using roaming and roaming. S m most of my friends they have to pay for it and it's really expensive. So even in first world countries, we still have issues with like data being expensive. So let's try and build better APIs. Um, yeah, my name is Patrick. All the uh, information out there. That's my. Twitter handle, if you have any questions, happy to take them. Thank you.
Thank you, Patrick. So, do we have any questions? Please come to the microphones. Yeah, seems we have a question. Uh, thanks for a uh, good speech. And I have a question as a backend developer or a system administrator, let's say. Uh, we have uh, mm, a GraphQL endpoint implemented and uh, on, on production and I noticed that I have a huge load on my database and what kind of tools uh, do I have in GraphQL to investigate that situation because mm -hmm. um, for using REST I can try to find uh, what calls uh, were made and what data was retrieved but for GraphQL it um, Maybe maybe it can be a little covered. Yeah, there is there is a lot in Python. There is not much though. Um, so what you can do, um, if, especially if you use Graphene and Django, there is a tool called Graphene Django Optimizer, which is basically analyzing the query that's being received by your backend and it's trying to do fetch related, select related for you. Uh, the other things would be to implement a middleware that's doing the the tracing support, uh, so you can send information to Datadog or uh, maybe the Apollo tracing server, um, but right now there's nothing built into Graphene or any other library. Um, there are other things you could do to, to improve. Uh, for me, there are kind of workarounds. You can use data loaders, so basically there's a way to uh, kind of postpone the fetching of some information. So for example, if you're fetching uh, I don't know, like a list of blog posts, and for, for all of them, you're fetching the user as well with a different query. You can get the list of IDs that you're fetching and then doing it later. So when you know all the IDs that you need, you can fetch them, so you don't do uh, n plus one query. Uh, but yeah, we can also talk about later, and that there's, there's a lot. Okay, any other questions? Okay. Hello, uh, thanks for the speech. Uh, so I'm new to GraphQL. I would like to know how do you connect this with your database because this is not uh, evident to me. Mm -hmm. Okay, so mm -hmm. connecting, I mean it's like REST API basically. You have an endpoint where you do the data, data uh, let's say, data fetching and then you're returning. So you have find some functions where you get the data and you do this for each field that you have in the, um, in your API. If you use something like Django, if you use Django or SQL Alchemy, you can use Graphene, um, uh, which has Graphene Django, Graphene SQL Alchemy, where you can get a Django model or SQL Alchemy model and it's converting to a uh, GraphQL type, and so you don't have to do write the GraphQL type again. But you still have to do uh, like the queries yourself. There is also some tools like there is support for Django filter in Graphene as well, so you can plug that in and also gives you arguments so you can do filtering on the front end. Okay. Any questions? Don't be shy. <laughs> okay, we have one question. Uh, can you go into a bit more detail of, um, of the the differences with the graphene and why why you had to do something new? Uh, yes. Okay, so when I, I started this in October when graphene was, so basically the main maintainer of graphene uh, stepped down and it was basically working on the project, but the problem was that it didn't give access to maintaining the graphene 21. So basically it was a moment where I was doing progress. I did a couple of progress, like uh, Django REST framework support for Graphene, it's something I've done. But yeah, I was trying to, and to contribute, but there was like, a lot of friction because basically no one was able to merge stuff. Uh, I think now in April we got access to GitHub and PyPI to publish things. So now there's people working on it. I'm trying to work, but I'm focusing mainly on this. I said also because I want to experiment with new feature and try a uh, different way of doing things. Any more questions? Okay. Hey, thank, thank you for the talk. 
Uh, I was just wondering, like, how you feel about schema-first development versus like the code-first? Oh workflow? yeah. So, yeah, as I mentioned, the first two are schema-first. Uh, sorry, uh, code-first, and the other two are um, schema-first. Um, I prefer code-first, uh, especially because I said like Python is really nice to write, and like especially with, with Strawberry, you can reuse types, you can reuse data classes that you already have, wrap them as a GraphQL type, and it works and you get auto completion and all this stuff, while um, we schema first is a bit different. It's, it's, this is my personal preference. I don't like uh, uh, schema first. There are, there are people that like them, especially like, I think there, there are libraries doing that. And I think I, I don't like writing things twice, because you have to write the schema, and then you have to touch it, and you need to be sure that also you're doing things in the right way, because you, if you mistype something, it's not, it's not working. Um, but yeah, it's a matter of preference, I guess. Uh, yeah, there, I mean, there might be some cases where you, uh, actually, I don't think, can't think of any, but there was someone building a dynamic schema, and they needed to do schema first, because they had like a schema as a string, so we couldn't cut anything together. But I don't see that being something common. Thanks. Okay. Other questions? No? Okay. Thank you, Thank Patrick. You.